right, the Dayton City Commission meeting will now come to order. Would you all please rise for the invocation and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, this morning, the invocation will be given by Commissioner Shaw. Dear God, this morning we gather for the State of the City Address. We ask that you bless this commission individually and collectively with the vision and the strength to carry out the mission of this address. We stand as a reflection of the tools necessary to implement and enact the goals charged by the citizens, and we ask that you direct our paths to promote prosperity and growth within our community. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Lavender, may we have the roll call? Mayor Whaley? Aye. Commissioners Joseph? Aye. Mims? Aye. Shaw? Aye. May I have a motion to authorize the absence of Commissioner Williams from so this moved. week's meeting? Mm -hmm. Second the motion. It's been right. properly moved and seconded to authorize the absence of Commissioner Williams from this week's meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? May I have a motion to approve the minutes of the February 7th, 2018 meeting? So moved, Your Honor. Second, Your Honor. It's been properly moved and seconded to approve the minutes from the February 7th, 2018 meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ms. Lavender, what's the order of business today? Mayor Whaley, the sole order of business today is to present the annual State of the City Address. Each year, a Dayton City Commission meeting is set aside for the purpose of reporting the State of the City, highlighting some of the accomplishments of the year past and remarking on initiatives for the year ahead. I am informed that you will present your remarks and then we'll adjourn the meeting from the podium. Thank you, Ms. Lavender. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Members of the City Commission, City Manager Dickstein, distinguished guests, members of the city staff, friends and neighbors, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Valentine's Day is a day of love, a day that's been set aside to express affection and appreciation for those who have touched our lives in a special way. It's been estimated that about 190 million Valentines are sent out each year in the U.S. And when you add in the Valentine cards exchanged in school activities, the amount reaches around 1 billion cards. I just would like to share, yesterday I got a card from my niece, Abby. She even signed it, she's five, so even I got a Valentine. Take note, Sam. <laughs> 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 I love exchanging Valentine's Day cards with my friends and when I was a little girl. And now when I do get chocolates or some pretty flowers from Sam, it's always appreciated. Whether the way we show our appreciation or love, Feb however we do it, February 14th is a great way to do it. So it's fitting that this year's State of the City Address should fall on Valentine's Day. It's an honor to share with you this review of the city we all love and to highlight our accomplishments, our challenges, and the opportunities that lie ahead. This past year, we witnessed strong job creation in Dayton, both in the creation of new businesses and through investment in current employers. Additionally, much has been done to build our entrepreneurship culture. The city partnered with the Entrepreneur Center, the Dayton Development Coalition, and the Downtown Dayton Partnership on Start Downtown and Accelerate Dayton. These programs give consulting help to companies and potential companies in all corners of our city. A partnership between the Dayton Minority Business Assistance Center and Wright State University was awarded a $50,000 grant from Fifth Third Bank to provide technical assistance to clients seeking business certification. This allows small businesses to have a leg up when competing for state and federal contracts. Because of the terrific work of the Human Relations Council and our Purchasing and Public Works Department, the city is walking the talk with these efforts locally as well. Nearly one-fourth of the city's construction contracts were awarded to certified small businesses, minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, and Dayton local small businesses. And we are pleased with the newly opened Innovation Center at 444 East 2nd Street that includes the Air Force Research Lab. This project is exactly what Commissioner Joseph envisioned, bringing the assets of the Wright Pat Air Force Base right to downtown. Just spend a little time at the Fourth Friday co-working at 444, and you will love seeing the collaboration, innovation, and invention 
that is being created in Dayton. Last summer, the city partnered with the Regional Film Commission to support filming of a major motion picture, The Old Man and the Gun, in the Liberty Tower and in downtown Dayton. In addition to the positive impact film production can have on our local economy, I noticed many Daytonians having fun hoping to spot their secret loves, Danny Glover and Robert Redford on downtown street and at local eateries. <coughs> the investment in our city this past year was impressive. I'm just going to give you a few examples. Dayton Children's opened its new 260,000 square foot patient tower in Old North Dayton in June. The tower houses inpatient and outpatient services and represents a $168 million investment. Dayton's new 64 million main branch of the Dayton Metro Library opened in August. Code Credit Union completed its headquarters expansion on Monument Avenue overlooking the Great Miami River. Manufacturing firm from Com Composite Advantage purchased the former Firestone Tire Warehouse in West Dayton. And STP Products opened its 570,000 square foot facility at the Dayton International Airport. The housing market is rebounding from the Great Recession, and downtown and the neighborhoods surrounding the urban center continue to be one of the hottest areas around. The walkability, amenities, diversity, and inclusivity is what's driving this market. There is simply no other place like downtown Dayton in the rest of this region. The flats at South Park are complete and have transformed Warren Street with more housing just approved by the City Commission last month for this development. Charlie Sims Development continues work on several townhouse projects, including Monument Walk, the Brownstones at Second, and City View. Water Street Development continues to expand with 54 additional units nearing completion. The former Delco factory has been transformed into 130 apartment, union, apartment units and Lock 27 overlooking the plaza at Fifth Third Field. Try a pierogi and a beer before the next Dragons game. I'm sure you will love it. We expect this development to continue in 2018. Construction should be completed in 2019 on the new CareSource office tower on East First Street, which will house 900 employees. The investment in Dayton and CareSource has transformed the east side of downtown. When the new office building is complete, a company that started in the closet of Miami Valley Hospital will own three buildings and employ over 24 people in our downtown. And we know CareSource had choices on whether to invest in Dayton. They now provide services throughout Ohio and in multiple states. Their growth and their success has been breathtaking. Pam Morris, the CEO and founder of CareSource, believed in Dayton and in her company's growth. And she knew that they were connected. Her commitment and love for Dayton over the past 30 years has changed the course of our city's history. Now, Pam has announced she will be retiring this May. We are excited for her and are so grateful for her belief in our city. And we all wish Pam the best as she begins this new chapter in her life. The Levitt Pavilion completed fundraising efforts for the state-of-the-art music venue at Dave Hall Plaza in, in the heart of downtown Dayton. Construction began just earlier this year. Two hotels are expected to open this year. The Holiday Inn Express is nearing completion on Edwin C. Moses, and construction on the 98-room Fairfield Inn and Suites continues at the successful Water Street development. The Dayton Arcade renovation project attracted $9 million in historic tax credits in 2017, bringing the project closer to securing the $90 million necessary to reinvent the storied property. For a few decades, the arcade has been living on love alone. We are very close to seeing this building have a new story, with both new and older generations getting the chance to fall in love with it all over again. Dayton has been able to invest in its neighborhoods like never before because the love our voters showed for the city in 2016. We paved over 60 lane miles of residential streets in 2017, this is the most residential paving completed in one year that has incurred in the last 40 years. 
We are on track after the first year to keep our promise of every residential road being in satisfactory condition at the end of the eight-year cycle. Our streets are looking and feeling better, and so are our neighborhoods because of the Your Dollars, Your Neighborhood program. We were able to mow vacant properties every month, making a significant difference to both the look and the safety of all Dayton neighborhoods. Our parks are getting a much needed facelift. We are able to increase the number of police officers because of the Daytonians' love of their city. We will continue with our work on the Your Dollars, Your Neighborhood program through 2018, and we want to be transparent in this process. That is why I'm so proud of the dashboard in place for citizens to get real-time data on this work. You can go to our website's front page at DaytonOhio.gov and see how much money has been encumbered and data around all of these programs. You can even see which lots have been mowed and how far along we are in each cycle in real time. We have made great progress and expect to continue to see growth in Dayton, but much of the growth we have experienced is uneven. The inequality in market forces can be seen throughout the Dayton region, and nowhere is it more glaringly than in West Dayton. The announcement of the closure of Good Sam Hospital was one of the toughest days I have had as mayor. Good Samaritan has had significant impact on the neighborhoods that surround the hospital. It is why the city has invested nearly $12 million in those neighborhoods and why we have seen nearly $64 million of investment in the Northern Salem Avenue area. Further, the commissioners and I are very concerned about health access for the residents who live in the northern and western parts of Dayton and Montgomery County. Good Samaritan reports nearly 60,000 emergency room visits every single year. The closing of Good Sam will affect access to health care for thousands of Daytonians. In addition to the economic and health access concerns, the loss of the hospital has been an emotional blow as well. The stories people have shared with me about what the hospital has meant to their lives has been touching. I received calls from many of the ministers in West Dayton concerned about the impact this would have on their members, neighbors, and friends. Their activism and leadership on this issue has been essential to communicating the community's voice. One particular call from Pastor Washington from Phillips Temple really struck a chord. How, he told me how his entire family had been born at Good Samaritan, how they relied on the facility for care and services. For many Daytonians, this announcement has felt no less than like a death in their family. After loss, it is difficult to move forward, but move forward we must. The City Commission is committed to doing everything in our power to make sure that access to health care is addressed with this closing. We are grateful for the help of Jeff Cooper at Public Health, as well as the leadership at Five Rivers Health Clinic to help guide us in this important work. The City will continue to make sure the community has meaningful meaningful input with the redevelopment of the Good Samaritan site, and we will use all of our tools to make sure that these two objectives are met. Now, talking about health, we have lots to do in West Dayton, and it doesn't stop at hospitals and health care. The access to healthy foods is needed, and again, we are disappointed in the lack of leadership coming from private companies in this front. The Jim City Market saw a need in our community and is endeavoring to meet this need. It is working to locate a vibrant, community-centered, full-service grocery store along Lower Salem Avenue. The store will feature affordable, quality kitchen stables, including well-stocked fresh produce and meat departments, as well as specially local and organic products that make a store the store a unique draw. Under the terrific leadership of Leela Klein, the Jim City Board recognized the asset they had in the neighborhoods and in the people of Dayton and went to work to bring us together to solve this incredible need in our city. This is the model we will have to get more comfortable with in Dayton. It is going to take all of us pulling together and thinking differently about how we address these tough issues that have plagued our community for decades. The Jim City Market needs our help and support. And I, too, believe in the heart and determination of Daytonians. I look forward to the day when my groceries come from Jim City Market. The West Dayton framework under the leadership of Commissioner Shaw and John Lupkin is a crucial element as we continue the HUD Choice Neighborhood Grants. 
The work is broad and deep, encompassing 18 Dayton neighborhoods and being holistic in the needs and the neighborhoods and the people who live there. Already this work is making a difference. The cleanup of Lakeside Lake with the partnership of the Ohio AFL-CIO is stunning, with more amenities coming this year. This past year's porch tours were held in neighborhoods that previously had no organization. Community members are taking ownership of their neighborhood, and it is making these neighborhoods <coughs> stronger. Now, another major challenge I want to address today is the opioid epidemic. With the prevalence of fentanyl in our community, we had the highest death rate for accidental overdoses last year in our history, a 35% increase in deaths from 2016 to 2017. Dayton Public Safety Services responded to over 3,400 calls for service related to overdoses last year. Since 2015, the city of Dayton has administered almost 23,000 doses of Narcan throughout Dayton. And in 2017, the county's Care Point Harm Reduction Needle Exchange Program exchanged over 125,000 needles, a nearly 60% increase from 2016. The numbers are so staggering, we often become desensitized to the tragic consequences for this crisis. But for many of us, it is too personal. For me, it got personal in 2008 when I learned a young man whose family lived two streets away from me, from my family's home when I was growing up, who I used to babysit for when he was five and I was 13, died from an overdose at the age of 23. Or was the call I got a few months ago telling me a family friend that I've known for more than 20 years had overdosed twice in one week in one of our local parks. This is a young man with a good paying job, a young man who had served our nation in the armed forces and now had a family of his own. It took four doses of Narcan to revive him. Nearly every week, almost every day, I encounter a personal story of loss to the opioid epidemic. All are different, but many have similar threads. One that nearly 80% of all the stories have is where it all started, with the prescription pain reliever. That is why in June, Dayton was the fourth city in the nation and the first in Ohio to file suit against the drug manufacturers, distributors, and doctors who started this mess. Today, over 100 cities and counties across the country, and including Montgomery County, which announced Thursday yesterday, have followed Dayton's lead. Right now, taxpayers are paying for this cleanup. It is time we hold those who started this ec epidemic accountable for it. Because this epidemic has hit our community harder than anywhere else in the nation, we are learning and acting faster than anywhere else in the country as well. The work of the Community Overdose Action Team that was created in 2016 has provided a countywide table for us to collectively work on the epidemic. And it is allowing us to deploy resources quickly and effectively. The Greater Dayton Area Hospital Association is looking at a better way to serve individuals with addiction, dependence, and mental health issues. People who suffer from one or all three of these diseases are being shuffled between the health care, criminal justice, and treatment systems. This is not the best method of intervention, and it can become a drain on resources. Gadaha is working with local health systems to identify ways to streamline those services into a one-stop shop of sorts where someone can be evaluated and directly connected with the resources they desperately need. This innovative view of health care could have a profound impact on the friends, family, and neighbors who are struggling in our community right now. These are just a few examples of the work the community is doing to combat this disaster. It will continue to take all of us to weather this epidemic and come out on the other side with a system and community that treats addiction like the illness that it is. The opioid epidemic is tragic. The city has had to face other tragedies and hardships in its past. But as I have said many times, the people of Dayton know how to rise to an occasion and face their challenges head on. Now, as we continue the work to rebuild our city from the challenges of the Great Recession, 
We know that providing our children with high quality educational opportunities is extremely important. It is our most important and most urgent economic development strategy. That's why when I first began my first term as mayor, I called for Dayton to become a city of learners. Now that call left many city staffers and citizens scratching their heads. While the city and the mayor have absolutely no governing authority over the Dayton school system of public and charter schools, I believe then and continue to believe now it is the mayor's role to call on our community to work on issues in all our schools that are crucial and critical to the well-being of our city. Our education system surely determines Dayton's future. Now, in the past four years, much has been done. We have defined quality and mentorship and after-school programs. We have begun the work of aligning our workforce needs with our K through 14 system. And we have begun offering high quality pre-K to every four-year-old in our city. Robin Lightcap and her team continue to show great progress with this preschool work. We are offering tuition assistance to families so they can afford preschool for their children. We have 50 preschools across the city that are opting in to the preschool promise. The teachers in these schools are receiving coaching skills and getting help as they focus on quality programming for our city's youngest learners. Other cities are regularly coming to Dayton to see the amazing work that is underway with Robin and her team. At last year's City of Learners yearly report, I said that K-12 was the toughest part of the City of Learners work. I am happy to report much progress has been made since late August. First, and importantly, the relationship between the city and the Board of Education is the strongest I have seen in my 12 years at City Hall. School board members and commissioners are in constant dialogue, working together in partnership to improve Dayton's school performance and quality. Under Superintendent Libby Lawley's leadership, we are all now singularly focused on providing a high quality education to all of Dayton's children. The high quality subcommittee of City of Learners has refocused with the help of Dayton Public Schools to work on six ambitious outcomes in 2018. Enhancing teacher quality for new teachers, establishing a cadre of professional staff members who are focused on addressing equity issues, increasing FAFSA completion rates within Dayton high schools, reducing the achievement gap for all student subpopulations, increasing student attendance rates and decreasing student suspension rates, recognizing and affirming the positive work Dayton teachers do to foster enhanced academic and social growth in the students they serve. These outcomes are measurable, and for the first time, we will be able to report on deliverables from the High Quality Schools Subcommittee for the City of Learners. Now, we still have our challenges. The members of the Board of Education are having to make tough decisions quick to get our schools on track. I want to commend them for their openness in receiving public input about these decisions. The task force co-chaired by Board Member Mohamed al -Amdani and Commissioner Jeff Mims will get input from potential business partners about how our facilities should be used most effectively to maximize educational opportunities. The public forums will be starting in March. The superintendent has already begun meeting with parents of the nine schools that have enrollment below 50%. I'm excited to continue the important work of partnership with Dayton School Board, with the citizens of Dayton, and with educational leaders in providing a culture of high quality education that this city needs and deserves. My fellow Daytonians, I love this city. I love serving as your mayor. I love the progress we have made. And I look forward to the tough work we have before us. After all, what is Dayton if not a labor of love? Thank you.